Anyone who spends a decent amount of time in Appalachia knows the knot deer. If you've gone on the Blue Ridge Parkway at night, you've probably seen him. Now keep in mind, if you don't live in an area with a lot of deer, deer are freaky creatures have on their own. They're really big, extremely agile, move surprisingly quietly, and extremely durable. It's not unheard of for someone to hit a deer and total their car. Once I heard a story of a man who hit a deer on accident, and decide to take it home and at least get some good meat out of a bad situation. On the drive home, the deer woke up and absolutely shredded the inside of the man's trunk. They're very cute, but you definitely don't want to mess with one. Just keep that relationship in the back of your mind. Anyway, the knot deer is more or less what I'd call a folk cryptid. Everybody has their story about it. They're all somewhat similar. You're in a car at night in a rural, heavily wooded area and probably a bit lost. It's not wildly uncommon to see a possum crossing the road, see blips of little animals with their headlights. You see a deer. You or your friend go, oh dear, and slow down in case it leaps in front of you. Then you see it more clearly. There's just something wrong about it. Something about its eyes. You feel your stomach get heavy like a rock. The hair on your neck raises. You sense intelligence that you shouldn't. It doesn't move like a deer. It moves like, oh God, what is that thing? Whatever that thing is, it's not a deer, and we need to leave. You hit the gas and get the heck out of there. A group of my friends got lost on the parkway once and emerged with a chilling story. They aren't the kind of folks to lie or exaggerate. Among other freaky stuff that happened, the driver claimed she saw a deer in the road. Then she noticed the deer was on two legs. Willofthewitch.tumblr.com Reddit post from r slash Appalachia by user justme357 Hey guys, so I don't really know a lot or anything about Appalachia, but I recently read some Tumblr text posts about an Appalachian cryptid or local folklore about deer that people see that are wrong. I've looked around the internet and haven't really found any documentation of it being a thing, so I figured I'd ask some Appalachians about it. Personal stories or any information about where the story came from would be awesome. Reddit comment from the original Tumblr post author. Hey there, this is actually my post. It's cool seeing how it's taken off recently and started making its rounds outside of Tumblr, which I never expected. I'll admit, the anyone in Appalachia thing was more about telling a good story and setting the scene than me really expecting everyone to know it. That said, within my personal area and the people I run with, there definitely are a lot of stories about the not deer that people will recognize. Like, oh yeah, I have seen that. It's a thing. I don't live there anymore, but I used to live in North Carolina, and most of my stories about the not deer come from the area surrounding Boone. I'm not personally freaked out by deer, but I didn't see them a lot growing up in the Piedmont area, so I know they can still feel very big and strange if you're not used to them being everywhere. There's not a lot of stories of people interacting with deer to get information from, where the population is more thin. It's still an occasion for my parents whenever they see them in the yard. I can't speak for everyone else's story, since I know one or two of them definitely sound like stories about regular deer behaving normally. Ultimately, though, my main goal was to share the story of a local cryptid, with all the campfirey goodness a good cryptid story should have. It's been cool seeing the discussion about it, and I've learned a lot from it. Greetings, and today I'm joined by Madison. Will you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Madison. I am Will O the Witch with Dasters in Between on Tumblr. I talk about a lot of witchcraft and folklore and things like that, and then I've also uh, have a history of giving some workshops and things in that area as well. I heard about your blog because of the not deer story that made its way over to uh, Reddit and was a bit of a trend on Tumblr. So could you talk about that story, the, the not deer? Yeah, so it came from the post that you're talking about was originally just sort of a campfire tale of this thing that I've heard my friends and sort of my surrounding community talk about, even though it doesn't really have a proper name. It would, was just kind of stemmed from people saying, you know, do you know that deer in the woods, but it's not a deer and it's freaky and everyone would just go, yeah, you know, of course, as if it, I was asking about a possum or something. And I talked about it on Tumblr in passing and somebody asked me to clarify. And so I wrote sort of this story with a little more artistic flair behind it. And that just blew up. And I, I've seen it quoted on Reddit. I've seen people talk about it in podcasts before. And it's just really become a creature of its own in a way. Yeah, you said in a uh, Reddit post that that was back when you lived in North Carolina, right? 
Yeah, I went to school at Appalachian State University. So I was living in Boone at the time that that happened. And that's definitely where most of my experiences with the not deer have been in that area. Okay, so was it uh, sort of just a, a general town rumor mill? Or no. were there like specific people and witnesses who said they saw something like this? I think it was more just a general understanding than a, a few people with specific stories. It was just the kind of thing that you could describe. And even if they had never seen it personally, everybody at least in my circles, knew what you were talking about right away. Like everyone had either had some sort of little story or knew somebody who had one. Uh, okay. They were very big stories. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, reading the post, uh, it made me wonder, like, if you could go down to North Carolina and like find like individual people who would have these like incredible stories, something like that, if there was uh, some way of like interviewing them about their experiences, or if it was more of just like a, a general thing in the town that was talked about, but no real uh, direct person to talk to. I think, I mean, if you were digging, you might be able to find somebody. But in general, yeah, I think it was more of just kind of a collective understanding than what you see with Bigfoot or alien abductions, where there's a bunch of individuals who have really, you know, like really sensational individual stories each. You wouldn't know anyone like uh, that I would be able to like interview, talk to, uh, like as I'm talking to you now about uh, a story in North Carolina about a not deer? I know one person, maybe. Uh, she was... I'd have to, I haven't spoken to her in a minute just because I've graduated. Mm -hmm. It's been a few years, but uh, she and a couple other friends, I'll tell you the short version of her story, was um, they were driving on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, our whole college club was going to swim at a lake or to just see the lake. And they were going down the right path and then just never arrived, drove for hours. And there's not really places to turn off on the Blue Ridge Parkway, but they just ended up in a totally different dimension, basically. And she said she definitely saw the not deer while she was there. And when they finally made it back to civilization, it spit them out on the other side of town from where they were supposed to go. So could, could you yeah. describe the, the quote unquote not deer, like what that would be to the average person? Like, I guess, describe <laughs> what that concept is. The first thing that is always common with the stories of the not deer that I've heard is that it looks like a deer at first. Your brain sees it and just recognizes it as a deer. And that's not uncommon for that area. But then the longer you look at it, it just starts seeming wrong. It doesn't move the way a deer should move. It's acting in an unusual way. And eventually you just get this gut feeling of that's not a deer. I don't know what it is, but I don't want to find out. I want to get out of here. <laughs> so the most part, it seems that's like an animal instinct. People do just evade it. I don't know anyone who's heard the story of the not deer that wanted to take a closer look afterwards. On Tumblr and Reddit, after you made your post about the not deer, a lot of other people started chiming in with their own stories. And I've read a few of those. And some of those actually get more into like it had extra appendages or, you know, lack of appendages or something like that. It was like formed differently. So was that a part of the original story or is that like other people who had weird experiences that are kind of different? I definitely think that trend. I know um, when the, my friend that I mentioned before saw the deer, she said she saw a deer and was looking at it and then was started to slow down on the road until she realized that it had two, which it was on two legs. And then she sped up. I've definitely yeah, seen people who say, you know, it's got extra limbs or it's walking like a person, things like that. Okay. Um, one more thing in the post here, the original post was yeah. you mentioned a story about someone who has a deer in their trunk and then it shreds the trunk. So mm -hmm. is, is that a story that someone's actually told you from the town you were in? Oh, yeah, that was a, an actual thing that happened. This I didn't know the person. It just kind of got passed down the grapevine. But it was a cautionary tale for how durable the average deer is. So he hit it and thought he had killed the deer and decided, you know, oh, let's go. Let's at least make some meat out of it. And then it turns out it was wasn't dead. It was just stunned. So it woke up inside of his trunk later and started flipping out and just destroyed the car, basically. Deer are strong. It's not uncommon to hit a deer and total your car. Yeah. So uh, yeah. With, with the not deer, uh, which is a great name, I got to ask, did you coin that or did the, the townspeople coin that as a, a name for it? I think I coined it. <laughs> I, I, I think I did. Um, I had never really heard anybody call it that before I called it that. It was just sort of, it was really just supposed to be a shorthand way of describing it because it didn't really have another name so I'm like it's a deer but it's not not deer and since that post has gotten some circulation I've started seeing a lot more people call it the not deer so I like to think that I coined it 
Yeah, it's a pretty good name. Instantly, you know what they're talking about. Thanks. Um, so uh, I should get into kind of how I got into it was uh, my friend Micah, who is in a group with me, the Appalachian Mystery Society. He's a, yeah. a correspondent of the group. And um, he posted in the, the group chat about in the, the monsters tab about the not deer and he posted the reddit post and so i kind of went around looking to see what the earliest story of this was what the earliest origin of it was and that's how i managed to find your post and uh, i haven't found any posts predating it so i'm like well this must be the source of course there are like stories of uh, strange deer and uncanny deer that go back as far as you can imagine like you know folklore oh, yeah. wherever there is deer there's bound to be some deer folklore but i meant like this specific concept and this specific story with the, the label not deer seems to come from your blog that's really cool i'm happy i've made my mark on the world i guess so yeah there's def i definitely can't take credit for the stories of the not deer at all because you know i didn't get it from nowhere but the i'll, I'll take the name so uh, at the at the end here you do mention that she didn't notice the deer was on two legs so uh would you say that what makes it uh uncanny or strange is the the feeling that people would get or the strange appearance of the deer like does it have to have uh something odd about it or can it just be this doesn't feel like it would actually be a deer some kind of sense that it's uh uncanny I think it's more the gut feeling, personally. I, maybe part of that is because I think that's where the fun is, is in the uncanny valley, you know, sort of gut fear of it. Yeah, the idea of it looks like a deer, but you maybe you can't even identify what's wrong with it. You just have this understanding of that's not a deer. Um, I've seen people describe the not deer by saying, well, it looked like a normal deer. It was seemed to be looking at them directly or more intelligently than like a person instead of a deer, you know, like mm -hmm. with the level of intelligence or consciousness that's uncomfortable to receive from an, a wild animal. Uh -huh. Um, so you do say in your post that you moved from North Carolina. So if you're comfortable saying like where you are now, is it far away from there now? Not too far. Um, I'm in South Carolina now. Still technically in Appalachia, uh, but it's more in the foothills, I'd say, than uh, than in the mountains proper. Okay. I, yeah, I do miss the mountains, but I'm not too far of a drive away. I'm only about an hour from Asheville. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so another thing I have to bring up is because you called it a, a campfire story. So I got to ask uh, how much of it is. Uh, is there any part of it that's embellished? Is there any part of it that's more of a campfire story than like an accounting of what you've been told? So all the stuff that I described was stuff that I had been told. But I think I just worded it in maybe a more, you know, like a more like prose than like uh -huh. someone just saying it. Yeah. But I don't I didn't make up any of the stories in there. I just am recalling what other people told me. OK, because uh, in the Reddit <laughs> post, you do say, I'll admit the quote, anyone in Appalachia thing was more about telling a good story and setting the scene than me really expecting anyone to know it. Oh, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I so that yeah, that part was more of just kind of the campfire management. Like, I don't think everybody in Appalachia knows about the not deer because there are some people, you know, who just aren't into the that kind of thing at all. You know, they're not into cryptids or the oddities. Uh, so I'm not expecting them to know it. But definitely in my circles, um, there were most people knew it or if they didn't recognize it right away, you would describe it and then they'd go, oh, yeah, that I've seen that. So maybe not everybody, but sort of the colloquial everybody, if okay. that makes sense. Yeah. yeah so I was going to ask how um, how localized you think it would be. How local is that story? Do you think it's uh, very widespread or just to that specific place in North Carolina? Oh, I'm sure. I don't know. I, um, I mean, I do think, at least in my experience, that little pocket of the Appalachian Mountains has always felt really magical to me you know it's always felt like there's something spooky there there's a lot of ghost stories that come from that region i think definitely around this maybe it's more common or at least i'd like to think so but i imagine anywhere with a lot of deer would have some sort of you know like you said deer are everywhere so everyone's going to have some kind of description for it so um you mentioned uh the blue ridge parkway is that where a lot of stories come from i definitely hear a lot of stories from the blue ridge parkway about uh the not deer and just all your other all your other ghost stories and spooky stories it's a it's a very liminal space especially at night you you told one story uh, of a specific person. Do you have any other like uh, stories that you didn't tell in the post? Like any other uh, specific stories from specific people? Oh, nothing as dramatic as that one. Um, <laughs> mostly just the 
Yeah, just kind of the basic description of someone saying, you know, like, oh yeah, I saw that and it was a deer, but it was weird and I didn't want to stick around and find out what was up with it and that kind of thing. So a lot of people just sort of casually recognizing like, oh yeah, that thing, but yeah, not a lot of stories that make for, you know, a good campfire story type thing, I would say. Okay. And I also have to bring up, because a lot of people in the Reddit post were bringing this up, chronic wasting disease. Were you familiar with that? Not at the time, but I looked into it after uh, people started mentioning it, and I do find it very interesting. You know, I like to, it's, I, th I like finding out the stuff behind the myth sometimes, kind of where the science and the magic sort of meet each other in a way. And so, you know, a chronic wasting disease doesn't explain a deer walking on two legs, but I bet some stories could definitely be accounted for in that. And I thought it was interesting that there was something that existed, you know, that probably fueled a lot of the stories behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a lot of people in the post saying like that chronic wasting disease can make deer act erratic and act strange. And so that was one of the little theories that people came up with. So I wanted to bring that up to make note of it. Yeah. I've definitely seen that before and I find it really interesting. I did not know it at the time though, for sure. So I saw on your blog that you mentioned the deer were your favorite animal. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> I, I've liked deer for years. I'd say my favorite animal now is hares, but deer are still a very close second. But I do, I do, yeah, I think deer are probably my favorite animal first. Not necessarily related to the not deer. I just think they're very cute and it's like i like their ears i don't know i just think they're really cute i like things with antlers so i don't know if that was necessarily motivated by the not deer but it's probably a reason i found it interesting in particular okay because uh when i saw the the story i had to go look and see if there was more to it and from the from the post it looked like there was like you know you were kind of quickly summarizing it so i definitely wanted to try to reach out and talk to you to see what else there was to the story yeah um Beyond that, I mean, I did kind of sum up the, I feel like the main gist of it in the post. It really is just like a thing that it feels like everyone in my area, at least who's interested in the cryptids and the oddities and things, was, it knew immediately what I was talking about. And I always thought that was really interesting that this thing wasn't recorded anywhere. There weren't really people talking about it, but yet everyone locally knew what it was. And so it just sort of spawned from that. I didn't expect it to blow up the way it did. You know, I thought it was just going to be like a, you know, like a quick, you know, Tumblr question that got answered. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it, it kind of just became a thing. So I feel yeah. like, uh, you know, pretty much everyone's had some kind of strange or uncanny story or experience with an animal where it seemed like it wasn't as it seems or it did something very strange. It goes back to, to folklore. The, the Native Americans would have lore about coyotes as a trickster or like foxes as a trickster and other stories like that where you think this animal could be something more. It could be spiritual in some way. So I think everyone has stories like that. And I was surprised when uh, our correspondent, Micah, he mentioned the, the story of the not deer and then other correspondents started posting their own stories. Like um, Teresa, one of our correspondents, posted a story about a deer that her mother saw on the road that they called the deer of death. And then oh, wow. uh, the, the Best Virginian, another correspondent, posted a story about like a three-legged deer that uh, was very odd to him that walked around the his yard one time. Mm -hmm. And um, I've got a story at least where I was, uh, you know, meditating in a graveyard as you do. Very, what? very normal thing to do. And um, a deer came out at a very uh, strange time. Like right as I was ending off the meditation, I heard the, the noise in the brush and the deer came out. And I was sitting on a stump and it just walked right up to me and looked at me. And it sort of weaved between the tombstones and walked around the, the graveyard. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Yeah. It was like not afraid of people at all. Wow. So I think everyone does have uh, stories with uh, animals that are, have some uncanniness or strange quality to them. And I think a lot of those are deer because of how common deer are in the places we live. And I also think deer are just, they're humongous. You know, it's a little harder for them to hide than other animals. In the forest, it's much more, yeah, it's, they're very common to see. You know, because they're so huge, I think they're a little more intimidating too, which kind of plays into when you see a rabbit that's not a rabbit, it's weird, but it's not a threat the way a deer would be. Mm -hmm. And I do think yeah. there is there is something uh, esoteric looking about a deer. It kind of looks spiritual in some weird way. Yeah, they do. It's just, it feels like they're just fat little bodies on stick legs a lot of the time. They move really silently and they, I think, yeah, just have a really big place in folklore. 
in general. So yep, and they're they're very um, sort of graceful and agile, and they jump over things, you know, while still managing to be very very dumb from everything I've heard. <laughs> I have the post in front of me that Teresa posted. And I was looking at it to see if there was more detail to it. My mom has a not dear story. This logical, educated, no-nonsense woman cannot be convinced that what she experienced didn't have some sort of supernatural element to it. She was driving along Route 817 between St. Albans and Winfield one night, and was in the vicinity of the AEP plant. She saw something massive in the middle of the road up ahead, so she hit the brakes and stopped right before hitting the biggest buck she'd ever seen. She claimed its head towered over the top of her car, and was at least a 15-pointer. It had been its head down and stared at her through the window until she was officially creeped out enough to start driving around it. She said she drove off, it stayed put, never moving from the middle of the road, staring at her car as she drove off. She dubbed him the Deer of Death, and still warns us not to travel that way after dark. It's been a great source of amusement for my sister and I, but my mom swears that this was no normal deer. I can't remember the exact year, but I know it's been at least 15 years ago, and we still bring it up. I'm not entirely sure if she's still scared of this thing, but she gets defensive when we tease her about it. However, the phrase, watch out for the deer of death, has now just come to mean that one should be careful on that stretch of road. Teresa RHPS, posted in the Appalachian Mystery Society Discord, June 7th, 2021. Her sighting was in West Virginia. Like, I'm from West Virginia. A lot of the correspondents in my group are from West Virginia. She my was... mom's from West Virginia. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So she's... Mentioned she was driving on Route 817 between St. Albans and Winfield, and she saw something in the middle of the road, so she hit the brakes and stopped, and it was a large buck. She claimed that it towered over the top of her car, and it was like 15-pointer. Oh, wow. It bends its head down and stares at her through the window until she is officially creeped out enough to drive away. Um, as she drove off, it stayed put, never moving in the middle of the road. Staring at the car she drove off, she dubbed it the Deer of Death, and still warns us not to travel that way after dark. Wow. I'll have to make a note of that if I'm ever back up in the area, for sure. Yeah, so that's cool. So have you ever uh, lived in West Virginia, or do you have just family there? I Yeah, my mom's from West Virginia. I have been up for a little while, just kind of when I was seeing my grandmother and when we were clearing out my grandmother's house. Other, so I've I've spent time there, but not a huge amount of time there. I never really lived there properly. I've just visited it. Most of my Appalachian exposure is in the Carolinas, for sure. Okay. Uh, we've got a correspondent in our group, Newman, who's from North Carolina. So like... Uh... My group is the, the Appalachian Mystery Society, and uh, mm -hmm. it's like spread out throughout the Appalachians to try to get a lot of people to share their stories and cover all things from monsters, spirits, UFOs, psychic phenomena, and all mm -hmm. sorts of things like that. So it's kind of a, a group effort to, you know, share these stories and uh, collaborate. That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> Let's say y'all have any openings. No, uh, sure. If you're, uh, you have to be in Appalachia. That's the the one uh, rule we've got yeah, there. Yeah, technically in Appalachia, only barely. <laughs> like the next county over isn't. You are free to join if you want to. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I might check that out. Oh, I, I guess I could also say that maybe the idea of deer being weird goes back to like the Patronus and Harry Potter as well. And think of deer being spiritual. People might think of that thing. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I bet a lot of animals that kind of sort of elevated in a way because now there's like a very a very deliberate pop culture connection to them. Yeah, there's also this podcast called The Old Gods of Appalachia that has a, a part where a deer comes out of the woods and like talks to a witch. Oh, wow. I feel like I've heard of that kind of thing, too. A lot of deer in the woods talking in usually a very arcane kind of indirect way, but mm -hmm. always telling something very important. Yeah, it kind of sounds like an anime thing, too. I think, like, in Princess Mononoke or something like that, they might have, like, a deer spirit or, like, an Avatar Last Airbender or something like that. It's just giant animal spirits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. for sure. So I was going to uh, bring up now, because when I looked at your blog and I saw that you were into, uh, like, spirituality and magic and witchcraft, um, it did make me wonder, like, okay, if this is the source, then maybe this is, like, kind of, like, a you know, like, what a hyper sigil is? Uh, I've heard of it, but what's your definition? Kind of heard the idea that sometimes you can put out a, a story into the world that then kind of becomes true, that takes on, like, a, a form, like a uh, tulpa or uh, yeah, thought like form. Oh, okay. I've never heard that called a hyper sigil before, but yeah, I've definitely heard of that kind of thing. I bet that would absolutely be a thing um, with the not deer. I could absolutely see the potential for that. Okay. So I wondered if it was um, like maybe because you said your, your favorite animal is deer. I was like, okay, well, maybe this is like a, some tulpamancy here. So, <laughs> no. Not intentionally. 
though I could definitely see, especially now that it's really picking up and getting a lot of attention, there might be some spirit workers out there who do try to attempt to contact the not deer or connect it to their practice in some way. Like I could totally see that becoming a thing. I haven't witnessed it personally yet. But it would not surprise me if it did show up. Okay, cool. Some uh, collective unconscious stuff there is what, you know, I was thinking about. Yeah, it was kind of born out of that sort yeah, collective understanding and then just put words to it. And now people are kind of seeing it and going, yeah, that's that thing. And then it just kind of goes from there. So I don't know if I really made it more than what it is besides just putting words to it, because the people that know it all knew about it before I said it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody had knew what it was before it had a name. And I think that's the coolest part. I, I definitely like collecting folklore. Like that's something I'm definitely aiming to do is like go out and interview people who have seen weird things and collect their stories and, you know, make sure that they people know about that sort of thing. So that's very good of you to, to do that in uh, some way with the, the people you're around and the stories you've heard from uh, like North Carolina and stuff. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy that it ended up seeming to have, I guess, real value to people because everybody started resonating with it. Yeah, I never, it at the time, I never thought it was going to be more than someone just asking me to clarify some slang I'd used, but yeah, I, it turns out I guess there was a need for a word for it that I didn't realize at the time. So if you come across any other strange monsters or folklore stories, you should definitely write those down because, you know, I, I encourage everyone to do that. Anyone who hears a, an odd story that's not anywhere else, you should definitely record it. I absolutely will. Yep. <laughs> if any of your neighbors see a, a UFO or a Sasquatch, write it down. It's always my advice. <laughs> I'll ask him and see. I've had some friends have unexplainable experiences, but not necessarily in the UFO department and stuff. So I'll have to ask him if they've seen anything, like what they're hiding from me. <laughs> yeah, so I was just wondering maybe if it was because the spiritual nature of the blog, and then you write this, if it took on some kind of spiritual component to it. Perhaps. I think the way my spirituality works makes me more open-minded to the idea of that kind of thing. Yeah, so I could definitely see people using it in a spiritual way, or at least um, a lot of people who do folk magic and work a lot of folklore into their practice, I could see that becoming a thing that they either try to contact or try to protect themselves from. Uh, but I also think it can just be, you know, a story. It can just be a thing everybody's seen and leave it at that. I think it's really just for people to do what they want with. Yeah, because there, there's definitely that uh, those different components when it comes to other folklore like Sasquatch. Some people are very into the flesh and blood side of it, where they'll say it's an undiscovered animal and they take a very zoological approach to it. And then there are the more spiritual side of the Sasquatch, where people consider them manifestations of some kind or some kind of spiritual uh, creature. So there's there's different ways of approaching things like that. Uh, the same goes for UFOs as well. There are some people who look at them as like literal aliens, and then there are some people who look at them as more spiritual lights in the sky, and not dissimilar to like the fairy lights and ghost lights and things like that. Yeah, I think I personally land more on the spiritual side when it comes to it. Uh, but, you know, I'm always really interested to see people who say, no, I saw this in the flesh, you know. I Yeah, I'm always interested in hearing that. And I guess that kind of comes back to the chronic wasting disease that we talked about earlier. You know, some of it might be able to be explained by that, but then we have a spiritual way that we talk about it. I yeah. don't know. It's interesting. It's a spectrum for sure. I always think that the, the spiritual aspect is what makes people reach out for it, but what makes people get interested in the subject. That's like, to me, that's the alluring side of it. I agree. Yeah, because you don't, you don't really see people talk about uh, the undiscovered animals in the ocean the same way we talk about you know sasquatch or bigfoot like you mentioned earlier there's not a lot of people being like i think there's this well i mean i guess there is a little bit of that with sea monsters but not i don't think nearly to the same degree as the ones with a lot of folklore behind it and it, it does feel almost magical when you talk about it and i think that yeah it's really appealing to a lot of people captures the imagination and then it has that sort of local side to it where it's in your town or the people you know have seen it so it has that sort of quality to it as well yeah it actually affects you because it's in your backyard yeah that's why i like folklore more than i like fiction because it's something that takes place you know in a place with people you know has more of a social side to it yeah for sure and you can tell a lot i think about a community often by what sort of folklore there is in the area and how that goes into just the way people act in the area you know what sort of things they might be doing as a response to the folklore because even people that don't believe in it at all and think it's totally bunk will still you know put food out for the fairies just in case and things like that 
And uh, mm -hmm. here in West Virginia, we got the Mothman, the Flatwoods Monster, the Grafton Monster, and just a ton of great folklore stories that kind of capture the attention of a town and then become the, the place to go for the festivals and the, you know, all the merchandise and all that sort of thing, the mm -hmm. folk art and all that. I have a, so I do tourism for my, my regular day job is I help do marketing for a tourism district. And yeah, we have some uh, battles and some things down here that we try to advertise, but it's always, you know, when someone figures out, oh, that old inn next to it is haunted, that's when people start coming down. And it's, I, I do find it really interesting, just what attracts people. So uh, one one point I wanted to make about the the not deer story, uh, based on you know it causing other people to come forward with their stories, is often it can be them recontextualizing stories that happened in their lives to now fit with the idea of an uncanny deer or something that is strange. And um, I've seen this happen before with other things, or I've you know read about these concepts of like a trend or a genre, and it seems that sometimes when one person comes forward with a story, it will cascade and sort of start the ball rolling and then people will share their own stories so i think that that's uh, an element that is a part of the story is this one thing that trips a bunch of other people that come forward with their story that spurs them on to tell their story oh absolutely i definitely yeah i def definitely think there's a level of confirmation bias isn't the right word but you said it like where it snowballs and people start thinking of anything that they have that could fit that definition and then offer it as if it's been that the whole time mm -hmm. yeah like the, I, the meditation story i offered is just a story about what i would consider like a regular deer that came along at a mm -hmm. uh, interesting time right but yeah. if you wanted to recontextualize that because you know it, it looked at me and that sort of thing i could say oh it's it's uncanny so it's a, it's a not deer right yeah. And I think it's interesting because I think, yeah, the idea of whatever a not deer is going to turn into over time specifically is, I think, still evolving. And I find it really interesting that when people tell their stories, especially because I don't necessarily personally look at it as a literal flesh and blood thing all the time, then I do think that like I almost don't really mind because it's just adding to the tales. It's adding to this like it's slowly creating a collective image in people's minds. Yeah, even if they didn't think of it as a not deer, you know, they still felt compelled to share that story because they thought it fit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a really cool idea for a genre because like I said, uh deer are a very common animal and it's a very common animal in Appalachia. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would love if people just started sharing their odd deer stories all the time. Yeah, I bet the comments of this, too, whenever it's finished, you're going to get a lot of more <laughs> when yeah. people see it. Yeah. So I think it could be a good genre alongside UFOs and Sasquatch and all that sort of thing is, you know, just uncanny animals. I'm sure there are enough stories like that, but, you know, just talk more about like specifically uncanny deer as a genre of story. Because um, there are like there are like stories of like the phantom cats, like the, the mystery uh, cougars and panthers that people see in the road yeah. that don't, you know, that don't really make sense to be in the region. So there are things like that. Um, they're uncanny because they're not supposed to be there, like the out-of-place animals. But the idea of an uncanny animal that is, you know, sort of supposed to be there, but just has some weird way about it is a, a good genre. And um, the idea of UFOs, if you go back, back to 1947 with Kenneth Arnold, he saw mm -hmm. these boomerang-shaped disks in the sky, and he said they moved across the sky like saucers skipping across the water, right? Mm -hmm. And then that got turned into flying saucers, and the papers ran with that. And everyone started sharing their stories of disks in the sky and strange lights in the sky, and they called them all flying saucers, even when they weren't shaped like a saucer. And then, yeah. and then eventually that turned into UFO in 1953 when the U.S. Air Force uh, came up with the acronym Unidentified Flying Objects. People were able to look back and see prior stories of lights in the sky and things like that. Like Charles Fort was a famous writer who collected anomalies and he had a bunch of stories of lights in the sky. So this Kenneth Arnold sighting published by Ray Palmer really carved out this genre and suddenly everyone's able to share their stories that maybe they otherwise wouldn't have, share these stories of strange lights in the sky and things like that. Yeah, I can definitely see. Well, that would be very, very cool if the not deer turns into that, because I think that would be like, it would just be so cool to be on the cusp of something like that. Yeah, but I do think, yeah, I could see the not deer being a genre too, because I think it's in when you think about it, it's a little scarier than something like Sasquatch or UFOs, because it's not something you recognize at first. It's kind of a, a level of a false sense of security and realizing that that false sense of security is being betrayed by, you know, you 
you've been sitting relaxing looking at something and then you realize oh i should have been running away this whole time <laughs> makes for a good campfire story it, it, it sort of fills a niche i think in as far as that sort of thing goes yeah it does remind me of like stories of like mimics and other stories of animals that aren't what they seem yeah, very much so. Um, that's when we get to the, the word uncanny. It's a perfect demonstration of what uncanniness is. Because uncanny mm -hmm. is not when something's like really, really weird. It's when something's just like slightly, a little bit something that's slightly off. And that's uncanniness. And um, it's kind of, I guess the other word would be insidious. Something that's like, you know, kind of under the radar, but there's something wrong there. The stories of the men in black, which are in UFO lore that come from Gray Barker and Al Bender, have their place in West Virginia folklore as well. They yeah. are stories of people that are uncanny, like people that are just slightly off, like something's weird about that person. And then they say, oh, maybe that person's an alien. Maybe that person's, you know, working for something. You know, they're like, a, you know, the mysterious men, three men in black. Yeah, I think uncanny and insidious is definitely the right word for it, too, is that it's like it never, whenever people hear them describe the feeling of what it is, it always, there's never anyone who doesn't feel like they're in danger somehow, even if it's just a little bit. Like, there's always the need to evacuate once you realize what's up. And yeah, it's just, it's very much like your brain it knows it's not a deer, but it can't place it as something else, which almost makes it scarier because you don't know what you're dealing with. That brings up another question, which is, would you consider the, the not deer to be like a, a bad concept or sort of a, a neutral concept or even a good concept? Because uncanniness is kind of neutral, like I'm uncanny sometimes. Uh, insidious, though, is more, you know, that's a, more of a bad word there. So would you consider them good, evil, neutral? Well, I can say how I personally imagine it, but I'm open to other people sharing their own stories with it. Um, I'm not going to try and monopolize the way it's interpreted but i personally always see them as almost like predators from mm. what i've heard people describe like i said before i've never seen anybody who has been like yeah that was a great experience and i definitely felt comfortable the whole time <laughs> you know it's usually a someone thinking you know i'm in danger or this is a bad situation that i need to get out of and so most people you know don't stick around for, to find out more about it. And I think there might be good reason for that. Maybe not necessarily evil as in actively malicious, but not good for humans. Well, I get that considering, uh, you know, campfire stories are often supposed to be scary. But if other people, if someone um, has a story where the not deer helps them with something, then I'm open to that because it is definitely a collective, it's a collaborative thing. So um, I was also going to go down, when I was talking about genres, I was going to quickly go down uh, the Sasquatch thing real quick. Uh, they actually begin in 1958 with Jerry Crew finds this footprint. That was in California. They, they call it Bigfoot. And it gets in the paper, this very serious looking man holding up this Bigfoot print, calling it Bigfoot. And from there, California's Bigfoot takes over and everyone starts talking about that. And then eventually it goes from California's Bigfoot to just Bigfoot. And then it's all over the West Coast and it slowly moves across to the East Coast. And um, the concept kind of begins there. But if you look back, you can see uh, sort of proto examples because now you can look and see all the wild man stories that were all over the newspaper of this hairy creature that lives out in the forest or this hairy man that lives out in the forest. And so the, the wild man thing is a, a big part of it that predates it that kind of, you know, could have informed those later stories. And then also um, Native American lore because there were ape-like creatures in Native American lore, uh, so much so that the word Sasquatch is a translation of uh, the word meaning hairy man. So they kind of synchronize, syncretize the concept of the Native American lore of ape creatures and the newspaper stories about wild men living out in the forest and then Jerry Crew and the big footprint. Mm -hmm. So that's another example of a genre that gets carved out and now everyone sees Sasquatch everywhere. So you have the UFOs, you have the Sasquatch since the 90s and maybe before then you've had more stories of dogmen and that goes back to werewolf stories of course and you know lycanthropy and things like that. So there's always some folkloric trends behind it, some tropes and trends that inform it but sometimes there can be like a, a moment or a catalyst that is the start of a new genre, things like that. And so I'm not saying necessarily not deer is like going to be that, but I just looked at it and I'm like, that's a really cool concept. I wouldn't mind sitting there reading a whole book of just uh, deer story after deer story of like, and then the deer stood up and, or the, yeah. and then the deer looked at me and I saw in its eyes that it wasn't a deer, you know? 
Man, that would be incredible if it does turn into that. I'm never going to try and predict, you know, what it turns yeah, you, into. But I think, you know, I, it could be just like, this is my 15 minutes, you know, or it could be, uh, it could turn into something big if people are interested enough in it. So I guess only time will tell. Yeah, you can never really predict folklore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like you said, it's very much just kind of whatever people latch on to. You could go to uh, some some high-minded ideas about like, uh, Jungian archetypes and all that sort of thing, like something in the story has some primal connection to something. Uh, there are like large bird stories that are like a bird that's uncanny or a bird that's too large that it couldn't possibly be a normal bird. And those are often <laughs> called thunderbirds to tie into the Native American lore. So yeah. that's another genre of reports right there it's like birds and i know for uh hares as well that's my new favorite animal lately because i just like their ears so much and that's the only reason <laughs> but you know there's so many things of basically rabbits with other animal parts you've got the scavator in i believe sweden which is a rabbit with wings you've got the jackalope in the southwest which is a rabbit with antlers there's a german wolpertinger which has both and then there's a periton which is it's a rabbit and a deer with wings kind of all mushed together. I don't know, I think it's weird that there's a whole genre of rabbits with other parts stapled on. Yeah, I want to get uh, one of those jackalope mounts. I have a fake one. <laughs> a jackalope are cool. That's like a, yeah. a that's like a carnival thing or a um a gaff, I guess they're called. Yeah, I I saw they mentioned it in an old Scooby Doo movie when I was a child, and it's stuck with me ever since because I just love it so much. There are a lot of those, uh, like, carnival gaffs and, um, like, sort of Ripley's Believe It or Not type stuff like that. Yeah. So I always find that interesting, too. Yeah. Okay. So I've covered yeah. um, pretty much all the things I want to ask about the not deer. Now I want to ask uh, if there's anything else you want to talk about in terms of Appalachia or in terms of, like, folklore and spirituality. Hmm. Do you want to let me think for a second? <laughs> I can't think of anything off the top of my head i'm always down to talk about witchcraft and appalachian magic and things but i i don't know if there's necessarily anything that i feel like i need to get out there right now okay so you yeah. haven't heard any uh like other stories like in in your area or in growing up in appalachia that you can think of it's a another good example of something that's odd or strange or bizarre uh probably not anything that you haven't already covered i mean i think everybody yeah like you said knows about the mothman and um, there's the brown lights on the Blue Ridge Parkway that mm -hmm. I've heard of. If you go to specific places on the route at night, you can see just these brown lights twinkling in the sky. And I've heard different explanations for, you know, what people believe those are. Your fair share of haunted bridges just tucked away in various back roads and things like that. There yeah. was definitely the a building that I believe is torn down now on my campus was absolutely haunted. Not anything that I would consider a legend, mostly just, you know, everyone's got their haunted houses Everyone's got their spooky bridges and you kind of grow up in your area knowing which ones are which, but it's always just kind of your local town stuff. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, a lot of women in white stories all over America. Yeah, that too. Uh, like crybaby bridges, things like that. Crybaby bridges. I've never heard that term. That's a, a common folklore where people will say that there's a bridge and then they hear babies crying along the bridge and then there's a bunch of different explanations for it like oh someone had a car crash or someone lost their baby or something so that's uh, a common folklore story that's all across america there are multiple private bridges i've never heard it called that called that before but that's very spooky i like it um yeah. i think i also got taught yeah just like little i guess for lack of a better word superstitious things mm -hmm. um i know my mom taught me she's from west virginia originally she taught me whenever you're driving over railroad tracks to touch metal uh either for good luck or to ward off bad luck i'm not sure which but i always do it if i can I've also heard holding your breath as you drive past a graveyard out of respect for the dead. Not watching as a hearse goes by, things like that. I haven't heard that one, but I also haven't seen a lot of hearses. So maybe that's part of it. <laughs> I was going to say another uh, folkloric thing is like uh, phantom hitchhikers, like hitchhikers that disappear. Yeah, I've heard of those. Another thing, and I think this might just be something my mom said, but I will offer it to you freely. I don't know if it's a widespread thing, but I was told as a child that you can counteract a black cat being bad luck if you own and take care of a black cat. Then they're like on your side, basically. <laughs> so to this day, I have a black cat. I went out of my way specifically to adopt a black one. Not necessarily as a protective 
unfortunate thing, but just because I've always had a soft spot for black cats. But yeah, that's a, a thing I've heard is if you take care of a black cat, then you are immune to the hex of black cats. That, that's nice, like kind of befriending the, the spirituality that scares you. I like that too, because I think it encourages people to maybe, uh, black animals are really hard to adopt. You know, it might help that if more people are like, yeah, let me, you know, get this black cat because now it'll be good luck then, you know, maybe that'll help get some animals adopted. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Uh, I've got a few uh, superstitions listed here that I wrote down from just my experience. Um, see if you've heard these before. Never leave a swing swinging or a rocking chair rocking. Ooh, I haven't heard that one. Uh, the person who opens a pocket knife must also be the one to close it. I haven't heard that one, but it made me think of a different one that I'll tell you when you're done with your list. Uh, you can go ahead and interrupt and mention that one. Um, I've heard, so I read tarot cards, and I've definitely heard a lot of people say for tarot readings and also like if anyone's making a doing some sort of like making a ritual object for you or something mm -hmm. you always always pay them even if it's just you give them a penny there there has to be some sort of compensation for it even mm -hmm. if it's just something little like a transaction has to occur that's cool mm -hmm. uh, if you talk about your dream before you eat breakfast it will come true huh have i heard that one i've heard um that you have to write down your dream before your feet touch the ground in the morning if you're otherwise you're going to start forgetting it uh mm -hmm. if you get chills someone is walking when you're grave. I have heard that one. If your ears turn red, someone somewhere is talking about you. I've heard that. I think I also heard something like, if you're sneezing, then they're dreaming about you, or someone likes you. I can't remember exactly what the physical symptom was, but it was something like that. Uh, if you forget something at home, you can't turn around to go get it. So you have to, like, walk backwards or do something else to go get it. You can't turn around. I have not heard that, and thank goodness, because I forget things all the time. <laughs> yeah. A lot of these, uh, if you actually follow them that would make your life very difficult yeah a lot of them for sure so some, some of them you can't really take too seriously but they're still kind of fun to collect and think about they're kind of like these arbitrary things like you have to do this you have to do this you have to do this you know what i mean yeah uh, and then i have if a black cat crosses your path you have to x your mirrors which is um i'm not sure what exactly you have to do but i think you like take your finger and draw an x over your, your car mirrors sounds about right have you ever heard of stuff like that, like X's? Like you can X something out like that? It's a very common, I think, protection practice that I've seen. Maybe not very, very common, but I've definitely seen it before where if you are sealing your mirrors or otherwise warding them, to whether it's with a wand or with your incense or your herb bundle or just with your finger or something yeah to draw an x over the mirrors and it's sort of saying you know don't pass through here this is not a door yeah well, well that's uh that's kind of interesting because these these are like superstitions i heard growing up from like my family and like older people you know like these are not yeah. from these are not from people who would call themselves like witches or spiritual in any way and they mm -hmm. wouldn't go in to like, what about that makes it? So they would just say, don't do this and do this and stuff like that. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, some of them, they just are. I feel like I've heard stuff about, or maybe it's just a gut personal thing I have, but like not turning around out of a graveyard, walking backwards out of a graveyard. Yeah, well, there's one that if you look behind you and you leave the graveyard, you'll be followed. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. And also, it's just kind of rude to step on someone's grave. That's another thing. It's like... Be very careful walking around. Yeah, I definitely, I know in magic work a lot too, one of the things I always incorporate in my practice is that, especially with hexes, which I haven't done a lot of, but every now and then <laughs> you gotta, um, but yeah, it's like when you're finished with it, you do not turn around. Like you, there's very much a thing of you don't second guess it, you look away from it. One was like, don't whistle in a graveyard because you'll wake the dead. I heard that. I was going to say, a lot of graveyard stuff in my family in particular didn't get passed down because I think my mom in particular is just very comfortable with graveyards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I said, I was I was meditating in one, so I like graveyards too. Yeah. My mom sat near my grandfather's grave and would eat a sandwich <laughs> and other people would pass by and be like, oh, I wouldn't be able to do that. And she's just like, I don't care. It's a, it's a family grave. I'm not desecrating anything. Just like yeah. talking to graves and things like that. Oh, yeah. Um, one is if you kill a granddaddy long leg, which is like the, the long leg spiders, it will rain. So I, I heard that one. That, that one was taken very seriously. Like, don't kill that spider, it'll, it'll rain. Wow, well, I haven't heard that one, but that I was one. told, you know, don't kill them, they're friends. Okay, another one is, uh, don't open an umbrella indoors. Heard that one. Um, never walk around with one shoe on and one shoe off, and that goes for socks too. I haven't heard that one, but that's good advice in general, probably. There, there's the classic one, like if you spill salt or your left shoulder, things like that. Yeah, that one I've heard, and I still do that one. Uh, one one that I heard, and like, I don't know if that's even a superstition or, or not. Something about like, if you hit someone with a broom, that you like, one of you will go to jail. Oh no! I'm like, okay. <laughs> 
Like, is that even a superstition or is that just like advice? <laughs> yeah, but it made me think because it's like brooms and like, you know, brooms have some like history and spirituality and stuff. Oh, for sure. Okay. And like the last one's kind of like uh, reverse dream meanings. Like if you dream this, yeah. then that. You dream about a funeral and there's going to be a birth and that sort of reverse dream meaning and things like that that I've heard. I've definitely heard some of those. So growing up in Appalachia, did you hear any other like um, superstitions and things like that? Did you know of anyone who did like uh, folk magic and things like that? Growing up, not really so. Well, ooh, there's a story actually, but I'll I'll do that next. Um, I grew up actually a lot in the Piedmont, but you know things still kind of trickle down. I heard you know you're step on a crack, you break your mother's back. Don't walk under ladders, things like that. Um, I've heard the thing of when it's sunny and raining at the same time, devil's beating his wife things like that. Growing up, I didn't really know anybody who was into magic work, but I did have one friend in fourth grade. We would play pretend in a very specific way that wasn't like other kids around us were playing pretend. She kind of took on this role of having this very esoteric understanding, and I was for lack of a better word, kind of her apprentice. And looking back on it now as an adult who's studied these kinds of things, I realized that what she was saying was pretty much identical to how actual spirit work works. And of course, we were nine. I had no idea at the time. But pretty much everything that I remember about how it worked and how we would ward ourselves and where to find spirits and how they interacted with each other like all of that was pretty accurate to what I ended up researching later and I thought that was really interesting that I was accidentally doing something like that when I was so young like children already do magic you don't have to teach them to do that it's just you have to teach adults to continue to do magic as we get older yeah absolutely yeah so I think like in retro like I thought it was pretend but we took it very seriously at the time you know so so I kind of I wrote it off as pretend later and it was really only when I revisited it as an adult that I kind of was like oh snap this is <laughs> I may have actually you know maybe that was my my magic experience as a kid yeah did you have uh like reoccurring imaginary friends not really weirdly enough i may i very consciously made up an imaginary friend because everyone else would talk about their imaginary friend but i always knew it was something that i had created myself in a way whereas the pretend stuff i'm still gonna call it pretend i guess but the the spirit work it wasn't something i had control over it wasn't something where we could just decide how it turned out it was like you have to do these specific things and you're under a time crunch and if you don't do it you're gonna fail go you know it wasn't i don't know it was interesting yeah it felt very distinctly different from kind of my conscious attempt at having an imaginary friend yeah i do remember there were times where like we would fail at what we were trying to do and i would like we would feel bad about it and you know i feel like that's a little abnormal for the way kids play i remember the school year ended and we went our separate ways and then uh she said sort of at the end you know there there was a moment where she quote unquote woke up from something and like didn't remember where she was and i thought okay like that's part of the pretend you know that's part of the story we've got going on here but when we met in college again years and years later she did not recognize me at all and i don't know i just thought that was odd it kind of just adds to the the strangeness of it all because we spent we were inseparable for a year Later with doing spirit work, one of my close friends at the time was having, um, was working with a specific spirit who, which for lack of a better word, was a demon. It wasn't exactly what we think of when we think of demons, but I don't know if there's necessarily a better word for it. And the energy in the room was like remembering an old smell. And I was like, that was it. Like, that's what we were. That was the energy, how the pretend felt, was working with this kind of spirit. You know, I hadn't thought about it in years until that happened, and it just launched me back there immediately. Yeah, uh, my family does, like, things that could be called folk magic, but they would never call it that, you know what I mean? When someone's pregnant, they'll put, like, a, a pencil on a string, like, they'll stab, a like, mm -hmm. a needle through the eraser, and they'll hold up the, the pencil like a pendulum, and the, yeah. they'll be able to determine if the baby's going to be, like, a boy or a girl based on if it swings back oh. and forth, it's a boy, and if it swings in a circle, it's a girl. Oh, interesting. I haven't heard that. That does remind me, though, of another uh, Appalachian thing that I forgot to mention earlier of talking a burn out of a wound, hmm. where I wasn't raised in a Christian household, so I don't know the vocabulary for this, but <laughs> there's a, supposed to be a specific psalm that if you say it over a wound, 
wound, uh, like a burn wound, that it it will stop the pain. And the way that you teach it to other people is supposed to be passed down in a certain way. Like if I recall correctly, it's like a girl can only teach it to a boy and a boy can only teach it to a girl. Yeah, the same thing uh, in my family with uh, there's a verse in the Bible that can supposedly stop bleeding. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff like that. They use Bible verses for things like that. So it's kind of like yeah. folk magic, but it uses the Bible. So it's kind of odd. Of the Bible's in a ton of folk magic. Yeah, the Psalms especially, I'd say. I know in, um, so I'm Jewish, and so in, I know Jewish practices. Um, there's not a ton of us, but we all talk. <laughs> and then <laughs> um, the Jewish witches. And there's a specific psalm that's considered like the anti-shadim or the anti-demon psalm that you can recite to sort of drive out shadim if you're interested in doing that kind of thing. I do not have it memorized, but I do find that very interesting. <laughs> So, so I assume that you've always been spiritual based on your story of playing pretend you've always been spiritual or was there something that, uh, you know, brought about that you should do magic? It's funny because I used to be very, not even a spiritual, like anti-spiritual for a very long time. And I'm not really sure why, other than I just kind of was. Like, I didn't understand how to be spiritual. I didn't know what that meant. I just, I think I'd been exposed to, you know, a lot of the pseudoscience and the woo and people who use religion and spirituality in an unhealthy way. When I get to college, um, I made a very close friend who was pagan, and I didn't know much about it at the time. So I started just doing research about it just so I could understand it better and support him, and then kind of realized as I was doing research, I thought, oh, snap, this, like, really, I really connect with this, <laughs> you know? I went through my obligatory Wiccan phase, got really into that for a little while. Just basically, it gave, I feel like it gave me the tools I needed to navigate the world. Like it was the supplement that I needed. And eventually I realized the Wicca part wasn't necessarily for me, but the witchcraft absolutely was. And I've stuck with it ever since. And now I've just had, you know, so many weird moments and things happen to me that I'm probably going to stick with it for a long time more. Okay, so I was going to ask, because uh, I read your blog, so I know that you're into Jewish mysticism. Is that something that you were raised with, or is that something that you found later? So I've been Jewish my whole life, but I was raised in a pretty assimilated way. You know, so we picked, I picked up a lot of stuff, like, culturally, but I didn't necessarily have the religious education. Like, I didn't really have a lot of academic stuff. I just grew up knowing some Yiddish words, and we celebrated some of the holidays, and, like, your stereotypical Jewish parents and stuff like that. It wasn't until later that I thought, you know, I'm gonna just research this so that I always know that I know what I'm talking about, and it just kind of was a never-ending rabbit hole. Several years later, I still feel like I barely know anything, but I definitely yeah. know more than what I came in with. Yeah, your blog's really good about uh, you know clearing up misconceptions and things like that. So I think that's really good. Thank you. I appreciate it. I read your post about like Lilith and things like that, and you went down the list clearing up a lot of misconceptions. Yeah, I uh, I think Lilith is really, really fascinating. The more research I do and kind of diving into not really original works, because that's always very difficult with mythology and things like that, just like reading sources and stuff and like kind of less blog posts, the more I kind of realized how just bastardized she's been in a lot of the modern way that people talk about her. So with that, that was really good because if you read like, most books they'll go into like the whole Sumerian thing saying that that's like the supposed origin and from your posts and from other stuff I've seen like that's a very dubious claim and that's not the same character so that's really good that you're clearing up that misconception thank you that in particular I think is really interesting because people will all seem to really want to use that as a, like a gotcha when people are talking about Lilith specifically in a Jewish context and it's funny because I'm pretty sure that claim was made by one guy and every other historian and was basically like, there's really no reason to think that it's her, <laughs> that one Sumerian relief. You know, it's most popular as being attributed to her, but there's very little archaeological evidence for her being depicted in that way. Like, it doesn't make sense with the time it was made or the way that she was regarded or anything like that. Yeah, the, the Sumerian figure is interesting on her own. You don't have to, you know, put it together or anything. Exactly. Like, we don't need to, that doesn't need embellishing. Like, it's already connected to, uh, I've heard Ishtar is most likely who it was, and she's very interesting all on her own. Yeah, so unfortunately, a lot of occult books will throw out that, um, like, supposed factoid. Mm -hmm. And it can be very confusing for anyone who doesn't know. It's tough 
in the occult and witchcraft world, I think in particular because because things are so esoteric, no way to really prove anything, which also means that anyone's allowed to pull anything they want out of their ass. <laughs> you know, there's not really a way to regulate the information that's being published. People making ahistorical claims and kind of putting their own spin on things and stating it as fact. A lot of the uh, classic occultists, they, you know, will just come up with a, a new idea and then say, that this is an ancient something that I got from somewhere and they'll wrongfully attribute it to a culture that has nothing to do with it. So that's a, yeah. a shame, you know? You think that, yeah. I think nowadays maybe it'd be more likely that people would just say, no, I made this up and it's cool and, you know, people will get behind it. But people like the concept of knowledge being like really ancient and therefore it's true because it's really old. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's so odd when people try to say that something's older than it is. I know a lot of people will claim that Wicca is thousands of years old when maybe some of the ideas that they're drawing off of are thousands of years old, but Wicca itself is less than 100 years old. It, it was formed in the 50s. Yep, Gerald Gardner in the 1950s. Yeah, and even that is like a very different tradition than what most self-identified Wiccans practice today. You know, it's like, it's very much still an evolving practice. It's not even really a tradition yet because it hasn't been around long enough to be one. It's still a fetus. We don't know what it's going to turn into. <laughs> That's definitely why I think that people should be more comfortable with the idea that something could be a new idea as opposed to trying to tie it back to something like really, really old to make it sound more official. Because, you know, all ideas have to come from somewhere. They had to be uh, kind of come up with and invented by someone at some point down the line. Exactly. Like, I don't think there's any shame in an idea or a practice being new. It's not like we discovered everything in the 1400s and it capped there. And, you know, it's eventually the ideas that are here now, you know, maybe they draw from or play off of older traditions that we're breathing new life into. Or it could just be a new concept that no one's ever thought of before. But if it works, it works. You know, it doesn't need to be qualified by how old it is. And yeah. hundreds of years from now, people were talking about all the, the UFOs and the Sasquatch that are roaming around today. Exactly. Like, give that enough time and that's going to be something spiritual, just warped and moved with time. Mm -hmm. And then there are, like, a lot of fiction that turns into uh, real folklore. The, the Michigan Dogman, which kind of was one of the earliest uh, Dogman reports, that's also something that started off with like a song that was supposed to be fictional. It was like an April Fool's Day joke. And uh, yeah, then that became a thing. And then people started reporting that, no, oh, I've actually seen a Dogman. And then it kind of uh, spiraled out from there. So definitely, you know, maybe in the future, there'll be some religions based on some blog posts and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I know it's actually bringing it even back to Lilith. I know the the original Midrash that for uh, context is basically like a rabbinic Jew writing that tries to explain some unanswered questions or discrepancies in other texts. Her story came from a larger collection called The Alphabet of Ben Sirah, which whenever I, I have not read personally yet, because I don't read Hebrew, <laughs> but it, it says it's a satirical work. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, oh, what does, you know, what's that mean in this context? And what's that, you know, what does that mean for the story that everybody knows about Lilith when she was, you know, the first human cast out of the Garden of Eden? And But it's interesting that maybe the way that we interpret her now is nothing like what it was intended to be. And she's been, you know, a very prominent figure in a lot of Jewish folklore for centuries now as something considered very a, real, a very real threat. So... Yeah, when I hear about that character, it typically is like dream related because um, there's a lot of they talk about it being related to dreams. So how true is that? Is it like is Lilith talked about as just this nightmare character? So typically she's actually um, what I would say, I think she's a common explanation for sudden infant death syndrome. Hmm. Uh, she has, I think, connections to dreams, especially in men, because she's also considered responsible for nocturnal emissions. She's very much has a uh, succubus energy where, you know, the sperm that, that goes unused, she takes and turns into demon children. But usually the big thing about her that people re like really think about her in traditional folklore is how, yeah, that she would strangle human babies. And so people would make Lilith amulets and things based on certain texts in those Midrashim and things where they uh, basically try to ward her off from their newborns up to a certain time period. Yeah. Uh, and then I've heard the, the term lullaby, meaning like Lilith abide or, or a Lilith be gone or something like that. Is that a, is that a fiction or is that a, a thing? I haven't heard that before, but it's possible. But I also know the Hebrew word for night is Lila, hmm. or very similar to something like that. So it could be from that as well. Very interesting character. She's really interesting, especially 
Um, in the past 50 years or so, she kind of got a reimagining because up to this point, all of the rabbinic texts and all of the major texts had been written by men. And so women were starting to get more of a voice and kind of reimagine this character, you know, because there's a lot to say about, you know, a demon woman in a, especially one that was famously demonized because she refused to submit to a man. And so that kind of takes on more importance in the modern century. And I think that also really resonated with what a lot of occultists were doing at the time, maybe. Um, but I think she definitely got Wiccanized a little bit. And I think that's kind of part of the reason people are so fascinated with her now is because it's sort of co-opting that reimagining in that mm -hmm. movement. Yep. And kind of likening it to the goddess archetypes and things like that and just kind of running from there. I was going to ask, uh, when did you start your blog then? The uh, Will of the Witch or Have a Magical Day? Oh gosh, this is going to date me. Um, I <laughs> am... I think I started it in 2015. I never really consciously intended it to turn into some kind of just wanted to document my journey a little bit and maybe find people you know who were like-minded and see what they were saying and I felt like starting a tumblr and I made it about that and I broke 20,000 followers last week and now I am not allowed to leave <laughs> so I, I do really like it I think I'm it built it into something I'm proud of do you uh think that you have any uh extrasensory perception or do you know anyone who you think might be psychic in that way it's hard for me to say it about myself but mm -hmm. if i had to guess that i have one you know if you believe in spirits and things then i think i would say i personally have a knack for being able to put that energy into words like picking up on the vibes and saying it in english um i don't mm -hmm. know if there's a particular word for that but like i feel like i have a good idea of like if something is sending me a message i'm very good at interpreting that message Huh, that could be like uh, like clear knowing or something like that. Maybe. Yeah, that uh, could probably be it. Or it could be like channeling. Clear sentience. I do, I have actually done channeling work in the past. <laughs> um, oh, that's cool. Maybe, maybe that's an explanation for that. Yeah, so um, it's very strange. The uh, it's, it's difficult, of course, you know, but it's very much about kind of getting yourself into an altered state of consciousness. And the hardest part is letting yourself go and allowing yourself to not entirely be in control of what you're saying and doing. Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, most people, they're in the front seat of the car all the time. And so it's hard to let yourself move into the passenger seat or even to the back seat. And sometimes you're in the trunk, you know, so uh, letting go of the steering wheel, I think, can be really hard, but it's definitely a practice. Yep, uh, letting the subconscious take over, that's in like channeling and like automatic speech with uh, the Pentecostals is also with automatic writing, things like the planchette and other oh, yeah. forms of divination. Yeah, for sure. I know there's definitely been moments where I was either channeling a deity for some... Uh, well, um, there's a couple, There's a lot of stories I can tell about this, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, I was with a bunch of other pagan people, because uh, I was still pagan at the time. I'm kind of like in a weird in-between state right now. <laughs> I was with a bunch of pagan people, and one of them was a devotee of Athena. I guess, for lack of a better word, it was a sleepover. A lot of us crashed at one of their places, and in the middle of the night, there was one person who kept talking or kept making noise or something and I had to come out of the room I was in they started apologizing to me and somehow kind of not even meaning to I stood up straight and in a different voice said something like I'm not mad at you just just go to bed we'll talk about this later or something like that it was not me it was not my thoughts it was not my words but it seemed to like everybody else was like yeah no like that wasn't you <laughs> and they pretty much clocked it it was like oh it was probably like you know her patron uh, there's also been times where I was channeling a certain entity and was extremely thirsty the entire time I was channeling and was just pounding water constantly and pounding wine constantly and none of it hit me until I stopped channeling and then very suddenly I was tipsy and needed to pee really badly <laughs> there's been times where I've accidentally referred to myself in the third person after doing it Channeling is definitely cool. I don't know if you would agree that uh, anyone could be psychic if they want to. You know, people can kind of build up the, the sensitiveness. But yeah. I think that anyone could probably, with enough practice and uh, dedication, could kind of become a channeler or psychic in some way. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think I compare it a lot to music. You know, some people have a natural knack for it. You're always going to have that one person who's playing concertos at age three on the piano. Uh, you might be raised around it, but that doesn't just because you weren't raised in a musical family or that you don't have a natural knack for an instrument doesn't mean you can't put in the work to learn it like anyone can learn to play an instrument if they want to it might be easier or harder for some people but it's never impossible yep that's a really good analogy thank you
Have you ever seen a UFO or do you know anyone who's seen a UFO? A UFO? No, I have not, to my knowledge. Okay, even just like a little light in the sky? Maybe a little light in the sky. Uh, there was one time, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, there was one time I was driving at night with someone and we saw in the mountains, there was a big building on one of the tops of the mountains. Pretty sure it had lights, but then when we hit that same mountain from a different angle, there wasn't anything there. It wasn't flying, though. It was grounded, but it was an unidentified object. Cool. Um, a lot of people who see UFOs, it's very kind of unremarkable. They're not, like, super amazed by it, because oftentimes it is just a, a light in the sky that could be categorized as a unidentified flying object. Yeah, they may have, but also I have glasses that catch the light sometimes, so it's hard for me to really say. Okay. Uh, yeah. Have you or anyone you know seen a Sasquatch? Sasquatch. I don't, I'm not really on Sasquatch turf. No, I have not. I don't know anybody who's seen Sasquatch or anything like that, but I, my, my dog was named Bigfoot as a kid, so that's the closest I ever got to it. Okay, well, that's cool. What about, uh, have you ever owned or encountered a haunted item? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Several. So I have a um, multiple items that I consider spirit anchors. Um, I'm wearing one of them actually right now. It is a preserved raven's foot necklace. I've had, I have bones that I have gone through rituals to try and contact the spirit of who used to own that bone. I have an old, old, old doll from my grandmother's house that I'm pretty sure was like a housewife of that house. But then when she passed away and we were cleaning up and selling the house, it didn't really have anywhere to go because that house wasn't a home anymore. And so I took it with me and now it's in my house. Ever uh, lived in a haunted location or experienced poltergeist activity? Definitely seen what I believe are some ghosts. Fortunately, they were never in the exact place that I lived, but I was would be living next door to them for sure. I know a lot of people who are into spirituality, they often have like some kind of poltergeist activity happen in their, in their home. I definitely believe that, at least in my personal practice, every house does have some kind of spirit, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to mess with you. People, yeah, people who are more receptive to spirituality and stuff are going to notice those things more or be less likely to write it off as something else. What are some, some deities that you've worked with in your practice? Deities or spirits or consciousnesses? This is going to be a list here. So for a very long time, I uh, self-identified as a Hellenic polytheist. My main deities within that were uh, Hermes, especially, and then Athena, Hestia, and Pan. I've had different spirit guides kind of come and go. And then I've got the House White that I mentioned earlier. Those are the big ones. And then there's been uh, times where I've been called in to help deal with a local entity in like a certain area. Like that was just kind of my place in the group that I was in was they're like, oh, there's a spirit like bring in Madison. <laughs> you know? What forms of divination have you used and what forms of divination would you recommend? The answer is yes. <laughs> I, I've i read tarot for seven, eight years at this point. I've also, I really like oracle decks. I have tried to read Elder Futhark runes and they're very cool, but I'm not terribly good at it. I do osteomancy, which is bone reading. I was taught how to do tea leaf reading as well, or you can use coffee grounds in the same way. I have a couple homebrew methods that I like doing with um, the Rory's Story Cubes, which are basically a bunch of six-sided dice with different symbols on them that you kind of cast like lots that I really enjoy. I do I do a little of everything with divination. I love divination. For what to start or what to recommend, tarot is very popular if you're willing to put in the time to learn it. I do think it is really nice. If 78 cards is intimidating to you, then you can try oracle decks, which can often be a little more intuitive and straight straightforward. Pendulum is really good if you have a steady hand as well, and there's a lot of methods that people do, but honestly, personally, I've switched into just using a magic eight ball. <laughs> honestly, you can turn anything into a divination tool, though, if you plan it right, as long as there's an element of what I'm going to call controlled randomness to it, kind of leave it up to the universe. I think you can divin pretty easily if by using whatever's around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of folk magic uses like household items and things like that. Absolutely. Yeah, like especially back in the day when a lot of these traditions were forming the local flora and fauna and household items, because that's what you have. Um, I really like uh, the planchette and the talking board, sort of um, mm -hmm. automatic writing, things like that. That's yeah. the thing that I think resonates with me most in uh, the form of divination. Um, I've also mm -hmm. done scrying before. 
I've done it before. It's not my go-to, but I have I have done it. Mm-hmm. I have a, a large like black mirror that I use to to scry. I have it like above my altar. That would be another thing I'd recommend to I guess to starting people is you can make a black mirror really easily by just getting a picture frame and painting the back of it black, mm-hmm. the other side of the glass. Yeah. I also like uh, bibliomancy, which is when you just kind of flip through a book and like you can like quickly point to a letter or a word as a form of divination as well. I've also seen people uh, call it shuffle mancy, where you put your music playing device on shuffle and interpret your question based on whatever song. Yeah, that kind of sounds like the stan radios that people use for like ghost hunting. Yeah, I've, I can see that. I've definitely done the thing where I'll be messing with my radio frequency in my car and whatever words I pick up, I consider my answer. So uh, if you have anything to shout out or any uh, projects to advertise there, feel free to let us know what you got going on in your life. All right. Um, yeah, if you want to follow me at will-o-the-witch.tumblr.com, you can find me there. Please feel free to send me whatever questions and stuff and hit me up. I'm always happy to chat about things. Other than that, drink water, take your meds, stretch a little bit, unclench your jaw, and do something nice for somebody today. Okay, some good advice. Yeah. So thank you for, for joining me and talking about the, the not deer and the other spirituality and Appalachia and all that good stuff. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yep, so best wishes for, for you and your, your spirituality and your uh, spiritual journey and, you know, your further writings and all that. So yeah. Thank you, you as well. So have a good day. Signing off. Mountaineers are always free. <laughs>